How's everybody doing? Good. All right. We're going to get to work this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, not in Psalm chapter 2, but I did want to read that for a little bit of background. We'll mention that a little bit later. Um, And if you had your ears open, you can now go to lunch at the Kerr's and dinner at the Dozier's (laughs) on Sundays. So just, just throw that out there. If you didn't catch that one, you can double dip if you need to. Um, you've pro- you probably heard the heard it said that opinions are like belly buttons. Right? Everybody has one, and they're not very useful. Have you heard that before? And that's a wonderful modern day proverb. But what that fails to consider is the small but significant part of the population that actually doesn't have belly buttons. And I'm one of those people. And so was Charlie Hubanks, by the way. So that's one thing that Charlie and I had in common is that we did not have belly buttons. And now. For the rest of the sermon, you're going to wonder why, how I do not have a belly button. But the point of the proverb, that would be inappropriate. The point of the proverb, I guess, is that Charlie and I don't get an opinion because we don't have belly buttons. Right? No, that's not, that's not the point of the proverb. The, point, the real point of the proverb is that everyone has an opinion, right? Everybody has an opinion on something, and pretty much everybody has an opinion on everything. Some are more, more strong than others in their opinions. But Jesus taps into this very fact in today's passage, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start at verse 13 of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. He taps into the fact that everybody has an opinion. And it says that Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And now Jesus is simply asking the question in Modern day English, what are people saying about me? And you might wonder, well, why doesn't Jesus just say that? What what does he have to say? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who in the world is the Son of Man? But as we read Matthew, as we read the the book as a whole, Jesus actually uses this title to refer to himself 28 times. It's his favorite way of talking about himself. So I, I want you to hold on to that thought. We're going to kind of put it away for later. We'll come back to it. But really, the, the big question is, what are people saying about me? Now, I have the privilege of being able to go in the public schools every once in a while and substitute teach. And one of my favorite places to, to sub is at the middle school for Ernie Brooks. And it's, I mean, middle school PE, right? So it's fun. You get to play games. But probably the funniest part about subbing in middle school PE is the locker room banter, right? At the beginning of the end of periods, the boys come in, and they put their uniforms on for PE, and they're talking and talking. And this, this week I heard stuff like this. What did she say about me? Do you think she likes me? And I heard, and, you know, the response like, bro, she likes you. You should ask her out. You know, like these kind of, we were all in, well, most of us were in middle school at one point, right? We remember... We remember those conversations and those times and all the things that were going on in our bodies. And, and I want to assure you this morning that this is not what Jesus was doing. Okay, Jesus wasn't looking and trying to test the waters of middle school popularity when he was asking his disciples, what do people think about me or what are they saying about me? He wasn't checking in with his campaign manager to see how he was faring in the polls of public opinion. Jesus was not concerned with people's opinions of him. And he certainly wasn't confused about who he was. Jesus was probably the most confident person in the universe on his own identity. But what he also understood is that for him, for the people, the jury was still out on him. People still didn't, not everybody knew who he was. There were a lot of different opinions going around, a variety of opinions about who he was. And now get this, like bring this into today. This is still true. There are a lot of different opinions about who Jesus is. Now, according to the disciples, most people had one of three ideas about Jesus in verse 14. They said, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And I just want to touch on these really quickly. But John the Baptist, you know who he was. He was the kind of wild man prophet who dressed in camel hair and went around the wilderness and yelled at people and baptized people. And he had been beheaded by King Herod. And in fact, Matthew 14 tells us that King Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. So 
Apparently, he wasn't the only one that thought that. Other people thought Jesus was John the Baptist as well. Elijah, the second one, he was probably perhaps the greatest Old Testament prophet after Moses. He was like Jesus in that he was a miracle worker. He went around and did a bunch of miracles, and we have those in the books of Kings. And like John the Baptist, he was wild and fiery and courageous. And, and, and what was interesting about people thinking that Jesus was Elijah was that it, it, it showed how much expectation there was for Jesus, how much expectation there was for him to do something amazing. Because the Old Testament basically finishes with this paragraph that talks about Elijah coming back before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So there's this expectation that God was going to come back, the Messiah was going to come, and he was going to put everything to right and restore Israel. So for them to think he was Elijah means that their expectations were high. To think that Jeremiah was, or excuse me, Jesus was Jeremiah or one of the prophets, it's, it's kind of a generic uh, designation. But, but it really notes that the people's opinion of Jesus as a teacher. He wasn't just like the scribes. He wasn't like the Pharisees. He wasn't like the other rabbis. Somehow, it seemed to them that God was speaking to Jesus and through Jesus like he did the prophets of old. He was more than a teacher. He actually spoke for God. So John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And here's an important observation that we need to see here. Notice that none of these opinions is negative. They're all positive. Everybody's got a good, a decent opinion about Jesus. And I think for the most part, the same is true today. I, would, I haven't taken a poll or done a scientific study on this, but I would say that most people, even if they wouldn't consider themselves Christians, most people hold Jesus in high regard. And many people are curious about Jesus. Many people are inspired by Jesus. But thinking well of Jesus does not mean that you know who he is. Consider some various opinions about Jesus today. We're going to watch a quick video here. Historical figure. I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't. I don't think he's the son of God. I don't feel believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm. Pretty sure he existed. Like I'm not gonna say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, um, and he to me is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened like religiously and morally. Was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and and hope jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh figure you know he just he, he was god and it was hard to relate to him but i think as i've grown in my faith a lot i've really started to see jesus as my closest friend most of the people around you have an opinion about jesus and most of them, I would say, are probably fairly positive about who Jesus is, no matter if they would call themselves a Christian or not. Here are some of what I would take to be the more common ideas or opinions in our culture about who Jesus is. A good teacher. Many would say, even on that video, many would say that Jesus was a good man, maybe even a great man. He was a wise teacher. He was a, a moral exemplar on the level of, of Buddha or Muhammad or Gandhi or the Dalai Lama and maybe even Mr. Rogers. Okay, now, it's funny, but I throw that last one in there because, because I think the modern-day view of Jesus as a good teacher 
we don't really go to those kind of high religious standards. We, we look at somebody who's a good teacher and we think maybe of, he's a really good, like a really good or inspirational coach, right? Like, like John Wooden or an Ernie Brooks. He's a guy that's going to help me succeed and excel in my life and do better at the things I want to do better at. That's who Jesus is for me. Or, or maybe we look at him as a strong and inspirational leader like, like Martin Luther King Jr. or Nelson Mandela, someone that inspires people to be better and things to change. Or, or maybe, maybe we look at him as like a motivational personality, like a motivational um, speaker like a Tony Robbins or, or, or Bono or, or Dr. Oz or some Oprah. You know, this kind of this... He's, he's inspirational to me. He motivates me to do better and to be better. I think sometimes some of us think of Jesus as like a favorite uncle, right? Like Kenny Loggins, but Maria's not even here today. Somebody who I want to hang out with. Somebody who, you know, does fun things with me and takes me um, backpacking or something like that. We think of Jesus as a good teacher, a good guy, someone I want to hang out with. And, and in my opinion, C.S. Lewis was the one who hammered the nail in the coffin of this opinion about Jesus with some famous lines from mere Christianity. And if you follow along with me, I'm just going to read all of them. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Quote, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And Lewis goes on to say, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice, make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So is Jesus just a great moral teacher? Or maybe as, as one gal on the video said, he was a great marketing genius, a master manipulator, like David Copperfield, right? If David Copperfield lived back then, he'd be Jesus. Some people do see Jesus as simply that, a manipulator, a marketing genius who is able, maybe like Hitler and others, to sway the masses to follow him. And over the centuries, millions and millions of people have followed this great manipulator. Or maybe you see him or you have the opinion of him, and some do, as as a piece of religious propaganda. And more and more these days, in our current times, many people have rejected the idea that the Jesus we have in the Bible is even close to the actual Jesus. That what we have here is really an invention, a human invention, a a a figment, of someone's imagination, a certain view of him that, that leaders or that those in power in the church in the third century put forth. And that's really what we have is a piece of religious propaganda so that the people in power could hold their power in the early days of Christianity. But I think there's even a more dangerous opinion about Jesus, and it's the one that is closest to the truth. Because it takes Jesus and it baptizes him in a commercial culture, our commercial culture. And it's the view that treats Jesus as one of two things. Either Jesus is a purveyor of all my desires. In other words, he's a genie, or you might picture him as a butler or a vending machine, right? Take your pick. But he's a pay- he gives me all the things that I want when I ask him. Or maybe I see Jesus as a product that I purchase. In other words... We have Amazon.God. And when we take this view of Jesus, and we all have it at some time or another, what we do is we use Jesus to give us what we want. And so we pray to him when we're desperate, when we're in need. I really need that new hot tub. Jesus, can I have a new hot tub? Or, even more serious, Jesus, I've, I've lost my job. I've, I'm going through this horrible time in my life. Come and help me. And as soon as, we, as, soon as he helps me, what do we do? We offload the app off our phone. 
We don't need Him anymore. We've installed Him as an app in our lives, a convenient and handy digital vending machine. And the best thing, the best thing about Jesus is He comes with free shipping. We've been immersed in a market culture in which Jesus has become a product to be consumed rather, rather than a person to be followed and loved and obeyed and worshipped. Lord, have mercy on any of us, and including churches and their leaders who've fallen into this trap of making Jesus a good to be consumed. Friends, Jesus is not a product. He's not a vending machine. We don't get to create him in our own image. We don't get to monetize him. We don't get to utilize him for our own ends. Jesus' job is not to meet your preferences. So so in the end, there are a lot of opinions about Jesus. These are just a few of them. But there's only one right answer to the only question that really matters. So Jesus asked this question in verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in this verse, Jesus asks the most important question you will ever be asked in your life. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? And how you answer this question will determine the course of your life. Okay, that's a big statement. That's a huge statement I just said. Answering this question, how you take, how you answer this question will determine the course of your life. Why can I say that? Well, I can say that because your answer to this question is the starting point of how you relate to Jesus. It's not, it's not all of how you relate to Jesus. This, this question can be very intellectual. We can answer it correctly with our heads, but not have it change our lives. That's why I say it's the starting point for how you relate to Jesus. But if Jesus is all that Peter claims him to be here, then he is the most important person in the universe. And how you relate to the most important person in the universe will define your life both now and forever into eternity. On this question hangs the purpose of your life. Why you were made, who you were meant to be, how you were to live. So if you think Jesus is merely a good teacher, if you think he's an inspirational coach, then you'll come to him when you need life advice, or you need career advice, or you need somebody to pep you up. But you don't need a relationship for advice. If, if you see Jesus as an Amazon in the sky, if you, if you think of him as your, as your personal digital butler, as the provider of all the goods and services you need, then he'll never be a central part of your life. He'll only ever be an add-on. And, and of course, if Jesus is just some great second or third century marketing uh, invention of marketing gurus, then he's completely irrelevant to our lives, period. So in the end, there's only two answers to the question. Either Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, or he's not. And as C.S. Lewis pointed out, Jesus has left us no other options. So what does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? Well, the title Christ, that's not Jesus' last name, by the way, if you didn't know that, it's not his last name. It's actually a title. It's a Greek equivalent for the Jewish term or title Messiah, which basically means anointed one. It refers to the ancient practice of pouring olive oil on the head of a, of a priest or a king as you were setting them apart to, to fulfill a particular role or office. And, it, and in Judaism, over the centuries, this term had mainly come to be connected with King David, who is the ultimate anointed king to whom God promised a descendant who would be king forever, an eternal anointed one, an eternal Messiah. This was the promised king who was to come and be the Messiah of Israel. And in Jesus' day, the Jews were expecting the Messiah to come and to powerfully restore Israel to its rightful place and and to usher in God's kingdom. And, And we heard these messianic hopes when Dean was reading Psalm 2 just a few minutes ago. 
We read there, we heard there of God's anointed king breaking the nations with a rod of iron and dashing them in pieces like a pot. A victorious warrior king. This is what the Jews were expecting. A triumphant military messiah. And because of that, they had reason to be suspicious of this Jesus character. Because Jesus' own ideas of what it meant to be the Jewish messiah did it didn't, they didn't negate tri- a triumphant picture. They just didn't meet up with the expectations of the day. Jesus' Jesus's triumph would not initially come through strength of arms or military conquest, but through service and sacrifice and suffering. So as the Messiah, he would come not conquering, but giving his life in place of his people. He, he would come not to lord it over everyone, but to serve and, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, so as the Christ, Jesus almost didn't live up to anyone's expectations. And honestly, maybe when you take a look at Jesus, he doesn't meet up to your expectations. He wasn't anyone's preferred or expected version of the Messiah, but Messiah he surely was. And this is exactly what Peter recognized when he proclaimed, You are the Christ, the King. But Jesus is not just the Christ. He's also, it says, the Son of the living God. That's a huge statement. But, but it was initially a title that was used for Israel. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God says to Moses, Say this to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is is my firstborn son. And then later in in Psalm 2, God's anointed king is called his son. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Speaking of this great messianic king. And then when God promised David an eternal heir to his throne in 2 Samuel, he says this, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And all this gets wrapped up in this wonderful uh, picture, this wonderful story in Matthew chapter 4, where John the Baptist is, is baptizing Jesus. And it says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son. Jesus is God's beloved Son, which means that He is divine. He has always been, and He always will be. He's eternal, He's infinite, He's holy, He's wise, He's good. Jesus is the Son of the living God. So here I want to pick up, not on what Peter said, but, but what, on Jesus, what Jesus has already called himself. Remember when he asked the question, who do people say the Son of Man is? I want to touch back on that now. Remember, as I said earlier, this was Jesus' favorite designation of himself, his, his favorite title. But what does it mean? And I don't have a lot of time this morning to go through the whole Old Testament and show what this means. I don't have time to get into Daniel 7 where we see this seemingly divine but human Son of Man coming on the clouds to the Ancient of Days and receiving the kingdoms of the world. I don't really have time to talk about the prophet Ezekiel, whom God always called Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. Needless to say, at the most basic level, when Jesus calls himself Son of Man, he's saying that he is human. I am the Son of Man. He's saying that He took on our nature. He became fully one of us. But Jesus is not just any old human. He's the ultimate human. He's the perfect human. He did humanity perfectly. Fully human. The rest of us, we're just merely human. We're not very good at it. Jesus was perfect at it. He's the Son of Man. So as the Christ, Jesus is the God-ordained King. And because He is King, we answer to Him. Because He's King, we owe Him our allegiance. Our allegiance belongs to Him and Him alone. And if He is the Christ, then we must bow the knee to Him. That's what Peter's saying when he says, You are the Christ. We owe you our allegiance, 
our worship, our everything. As the Son of God, Jesus is fully God, which means he's perfect, he's holy, he's infinitely powerful, he's faithful. Everything that comes out of his mouth is absolute and authoritative truth. He will keep his promises. He will do everything he has said. And because he is God, the payment of our infinite debts he can fulfill because he in himself is infinite and eternal. Only the sacrifice of the Son of God himself can pay for our sins. And only his indestructible life can overcome death forever. Amen. And as the Son of Man, Jesus is fully and perfectly human. Only by becoming one of us can he take our place. Can he become our representative? He can rightfully take on our punishment and pay the, the price for our sin and rebellion. And in that, only he can reconcile us to his Father. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of Man. Now, did Peter fully understand this when he said it to Jesus? No. We're going to see in just a few verses that he's kind of clueless again. Probably not yet did the disciples fully understand what they were saying. So I want you to take heart. If you don't understand it completely, you're in good company. None of us fully understand all that Jesus is. But if Jesus is who he says he is, then that changes everything. It changes everything. And to acknowledge the true identity of of Jesus is to discover and and to accept and to embrace the ultimate reality of the universe. And the only question that matters then is who do you say Jesus is? What's your response? And for some in the room this morning, the the response needs to be repentance and faith. Perhaps you're someone who's been trying to seek the answers to life, trying to seek fulfillment in life, trying to seek salvation through all these different things, all these different experiences, maybe even through yourself, and you just can't find it. And you need to turn around. That's what repentance means. You need to turn around towards Jesus and look at him and see that he is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. And put your faith in him. And accept the forgiveness that he's offered you for your brokenness, for your sinfulness, for your rebellion, for your treason. And if that's you today, I'm going to pray in just a minute. I want you to pray along with me. If, if God is moving in your heart and you're like Jenny said, God's telling you to do something, and the Spirit is drawing you to Jesus this morning. That's a beautiful thing. I'd love to know about it. I'm actually going to be up here afterwards. If you want to talk to me, that'd be great. One of the elders is going to be in the prayer room afterwards if you you want to pray back there with them. We call you to repentance and faith this morning. For those of you who trust Jesus, who believe with Peter, you are the Christ, you're the Son of the living God, who put your faith in him for your salvation, for the forgiveness of your sins, and for eternal life. The response for us this morning, what is it? It's to smile and it's to worship because he has given us himself. So we respond in worship. This morning we come to the communion table once again and we take of of this bread and this juice and it reminds us that Jesus took on a real body with real blood, went to a real cross, died in, in our place, took on the wrath of God, the punishment that we deserve so that we could have forgiveness. And how do we get that forgiveness? We repent and we believe and we trust Jesus for our life. So would you pray with me now? Our Father, as we come to these words in the Gospels, they're so simple, they're so easy to understand, and yet there's a huge distance, as DJ said, between our minds and our hearts. And so I know there are some in this room today who have never put their faith in you, God, who continue on a daily basis to reach out and seek fulfillment and salvation and everything in their life grasping after other things, whatever those things are. Today, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, the day of repentance, the day of faith. I pray that they would turn to you this day and even pray, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I have rebelled against you. I've turned against you, my maker and my creator. 
Would you forgive me? Will you please forgive me of my sins and accept me as your brother and as, as the son or the daughter of God? Father, I pray that there would be people in this room this morning that you would turn towards you in faith and that they would fall to their knees in worship because you are worthy. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And Father, find our hearts bursting with worship because of who you are, because of, Je- because of who, you have, uh, who Jesus is. Jesus, may you fix our eyes on you so that we can see you. Spirit, awaken us to the glories of Jesus so that we may worship, so that we may walk faithfully in obedience and joy to our Master and our King, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. God, do your work in this room, in this place, in our hearts today. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen.